Rita Hayworth kind of fulfilled something in Gilda, and she was a beautiful and cover girl, and you were never lovelier, but something was really unleashed with Gilda. It's, it's sexuality, but it's also a sensuality, and a knowledge of the power of her own beauty and allure. Her introduction in that film, it's so simple, it's so clean, because there's nothing, and then there's a head, and then the head goes whoosh, like this, there's a shoulder, boom. Gilda. Are you decent? Me? Well, and, you know, and she, I mean, she's a star. What is a star? It's someone who illuminates the screen. So your entry isn't through a curtain. It's not, you know, a shadowy hat. It's not through a door. It's a cling whew, and bang between the eyes. In anyone's terms, you go sex bomb. You can't talk to men down here the way you would at home. They don't understand it. Understand what? They think you mean it. Mean what? Doesn't it bother you at all that you're married? What I want to know is, does it bother you? The reason I find the kind of films that Rita Hayworth was involved in particularly influential and particularly interesting is because the time in which that cinema was made was a time in which very direct emotional melodrama was the mainstay of cinema. What, what filmmakers had to do was find a way to get the audience to buy into it and then create worlds. And also, there were so many things you couldn't show. And so what's been influential and fascinating for me to watch in these kind of movies is the way in which the filmmakers would, through signs and symbols and expressions and the cut of a dress and the turn of a head, the witty line, the use of light, is say, is say so much more with so much less, and particularly about things that can't or shouldn't have been said. I was true to one man once, and look what happened. I made up a mind then that This I isn't about us, it's about him. Really? You don't say so. She understands this power and can't help using it. It's a little like Ava Gardner and Pandora and the Flying Dutchman made a few years later. They're both innocent and guilty at the same time. Orson Welles was her ex-husband by, by the time they made Lady from Shanghai, uh, when they made that film together a year later, understood this very well. You could see it in that film. And she had an unusual combination of an innocence, an experience, a power, and a vulnerability. And it led to some unusual performances in the later pictures, like Pal Joey, the story on page one by Clifford Odets, and The Money Trap, also with Glenn Ford. Johnny, it stopped raining. Maybe that means something. You haven't gotten over it, have you? Gotten over what? Being superstitious. Come on. <laughs> Where, Johnny? Not back to the house. What kind of a guy do you think I am? I don't think anybody really knows that but me, Johnny. Not even you. The biggest emotional drive all my life was about the far away. A place far, far away. And these films, a film like Gilda or Casablanca, they're about places far, far away. And not only that, they're far away and they're exotic and people are running away. So at a certain point in my life, there was a running away part to it. So for, for whatever reason, I feel, like, I feel like I genuinely connected to, on a personal level, and very much through the film Gilda, an excitement about movies that are about these places that people who are running away, run away to, and they meet exotic, extraordinary, fascinating creatures. And Gilda is certainly that. Pardon me, but your husband is showing. Oh, thank you. Perhaps again sometime. Until that sometime, I shall only miserably exist, senora. <laughs> I always say there's something about Latin men. For one thing, they can dance. For another thing, what's your telephone number? Hmm? Oh. In re-examining, you know, Gilda and re-looking at the other day, I was going like, I mean, that's what I think about and feel in my life all the time, and particularly in a world that is changing like it is. And wouldn't it be good just to go out and be a shooter and 
rough it up and re-look at naturalism or psychological realism or, you know, you know, and I really want to do that, so I want to rock and roll a bit. Africa is more than 2,000 miles away. I don't think he'll make it. I don't think he intends to try. The idea of disappearing to some exotic place with incredible characters and that intense, impossible love and the drama of that, you know, it's not really a choice. It's kind of for me who I am. There's something fundamental in those stories that's fundamentally in me in terms of life. It's the kind of life and the kind of drama and the kind of experience I tend to put myself in and am looking for, even in the act of filmmaking. Put the blame on me, boys. Put the blame on me. Mame kissed a pile from out of town. That kiss burned Chicago down. So you can put the blame. It offers really an example of the studio system at its best. I mean, Guild is the result of the combined artistry of many people. Uh, Charles Vitor, the director, Rudolf Matei, the cinematographer, of course, Rita Hayworth, Glenn Ford, George McCready, and Joseph Kalalia, the writers, Marion Parsonet and Joe Isinger. I believe Ben Hecht also worked on the picture, and Jack Cole, the choreographer. Uh, he was the one who did the choreography of Rita Hayworth's uh, musical numbers. The art direction by Stephen Goosen, and Van Ness Polglas, who had previously worked on Citizen Kane. And later they worked on these remarkable pictures that uh, Alan Dwan made in the 1950s. The, the audience had to sign on to a heightened sense of drama, of comedy, of romance, of action, a heightened world. So you see that in the heightened cinematic language and you see that carried out through every aspect of this cinematic language. And it's, it's something to behold because the amount of labour involved in doing that, the amount of labour in ensuring that, for example, Rita Hayworth, who, I mean, finding the hairdo, you know, getting that hairdo to fall in the right way, that, that sheath dress she's got on, the satin sheath dress famously in Gilda, the idea of working that frock, and then everything around it, the production design, the way in which um, a shadow would fall, even like um, Glenn Ford's grubbiness, you know, it's styled grubbiness. I've been involved somewhat in the cinematic language that I've been dealing with in trying to rediscover that, and all I know is that you, unlike Verite, which is sort of a form I came from, I started with reality, gritty, grubby, doco stuff on the streets, and Unlike that, you, you just can't leave anything to chance. But people often go, why can't they do that anymore? Why can't they make... They don't make pictures like that anymore. Why don't they? Too expensive. Takes too long between the takes. Every time you call cut, you know, it's not just cut, <laughs> off we go. It's cut, reset the funny hair. I know this because we copied Gilda's hair in Moulin Rouge. And I don't think I'll spoil it for anyone to say that although Nicole Kidman has the most lush red hair, it's mostly a wig. And it's mostly, and it's probably 12 wigs. She, as our genius hair uh, wig designer referred to the many wigs, she's a uh, maestro, she's getting a bit tired now. But hair control, hair wet, hair movement, you know, it's, it's, it's as complex as a huge stunt sequence, really controlling that level of glamour in any kind of action. And you've got to remember that in these films, the biggest action sequences tended to be dance. Put the blame on me. One night she started to shim and shake. That brought the gowns through Gilder are, are gorgeous. In their time, they were shocking. I think I'm right in saying that the Jean Louis gown that is that became famous in Gilda was based on a John Singer Sargent painting, Madame X. And I think I'm right that when that painting came out, it was also controversial. Because the showing of a woman's shoulders and upper arms, but particularly the shoulder area, the exposing of this, the, the shoulder. And let me tell you that that Jean-Louis frock, and we know this, I worked with my wife, Catherine Martin, 
Wingo, the technology of frocks and gowns is something that is absolutely technological. I mean, it's absolutely mechanical. And basically, it's all about trying to make a gorgeous woman look nude without being nude. And the fantasy of nudity, the fantasy of the body, enhancing the body, enhancing the leg. Certainly the mood changed with the war. I mean, there was a kind of an emotional disequilibrium that made its way into movie making. And, and it obviously led to um, the creation of what amounted really to a new genre of what's now called film noir. And Gilda represents a kind of peak in that genre because it's so stylish and it's so emotionally honest, so frank. You do hate me, don't you, Johnny? I don't think you have any idea how much. Hate is a very exciting emotion. Haven't you noticed? Very exciting. Set up a guy who's selfish and horrible, but, but oh, so attractive. And at the end, he's gruff, he's rough, you know, but he is so heroic. Glenn Ford's very good in later careers, but he's never quite as grubby or sexy and cool as he is in this. He became quite stately, I think. What do you mean by it? Now they all know what I am. And that should make you happy, Johnny. It's no use just you knowing it, Johnny. Now they all know that the mighty Johnny Farrell got taken. And that he married a... The love frisson between them, love, hate, love, hate, you know, you can feel they want each other, they need each other, but if they go near each other, someone's going to get killed, a gun's going to come out, and not even to mention the Nazis, right? I didn't intend to come back so soon, but I want my wife. Johnny. There's the gangster side of it. You call it the gangster side of it, but when you think of films like Casablanca, you know, I often say, look, Casablanca isn't about Casablanca. I mean, the word Casablanca for us really means it's a metaphor for a place where characters are running away from something, they have a past, they're generally, it's border town, they're generally on their way somewhere else. Touch of Evil has a bit of that in it, border town places, you know? Sexy, strange, interesting people, big characters, big baddies, everyone's mysterious, plus glamour, all thrown into an exotic location in the far away, and all these characters come together in a sort of operatic storytelling. He's lying, like the gentleman I always said he was. Mr. Policeman, it was I. Keep your mouth shut. Mr. You Policeman. two can quit being noble any time you like, you know, because a man can only die once, and Munson committed suicide three months ago. Besides, didn't you ever hear of a thing called justifiable homicide? This picture, Gilda, was often shown as a re-release on a two-day schedule, Mondays and Tuesdays, with Columbia. It was usually Gilda and um, uh, All the King's Men. And we saw Gilda repeatedly at the age of about 11 or 12, um, completely perplexed by the picture, had no idea what was happening in terms of the... Uh, but it, we knew it was a very compelling film. Um, and so uh, the picture was exposed to us at a very young age, and uh, it was the kind of thing we knew we didn't quite understand at the time, but went back and kept watching it and watching it until finally uh, it made... Uh, extraordinary sense in, the, in its place uh, in film history, in film noir. Emotion is so apt to cloud the brain, isn't it? I intended to kill you with this, Johnny. I thought it amusing to have one of my little friends kill the other. But now it won't do. Because I have to kill Gilda, too. What is so compelling about it is this thing of it's this thing of illicit love, impossible love. In a place where people are running, coming and going, running away, and it's fundamental to these dramas, there's always this obstacle to love. There's always a grand passion, and then in this exotic place, old lovers, new lovers come together, and there's something in between them. Hey, what's the idea? Oh, you'll get used to it. I've never been able to finish a dance in here yet. When Balin comes down, I want you sitting in a booth alone. You're sure it's Balin who objects to my having friends? What I want to know is, who's this guy? Johnny Farrell. He runs the joint. But it's also, and this is what's so strong and so lasting about it, it's a story of self-destruction between men and women. 
certainly one of the most powerful to come out of Hollywood. There's no such thing as an almond in Argentina. No, I'll get it anyway! I will! I'll get it! It's an almond! I will! I will! I will! I'll get it! I'll get it! I'll get it! I'll get it! I'll get it. <laughs> and what's interesting for me in the way in which the world is changing at the moment is that this particular kind of story, this particular kind of melodrama, you know, I want to get off it, but it just happens, to, you know, it's like urgency, emergency on planet Earth. It has more need now. There's more need for that. Our audience happens to need it now. So goodness knows what that means for my own particular trajectory, except the wise thing would be to, instead of make a film about running away to a faraway place, is to retire and run away to a faraway place. Mm -hmm.